Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering pediatrics, upper respiratory infections, part two. If you haven't watched part one, be sure to watch it, but you don't have to watch it in order. You can watch this one first and then go back to part one, but it is a series of upper respiratory infections for the pediatric patient. All right, before we get started, guys, I'm going to ask you as always to please support me, support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it. Go ahead, press that like button now. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. Um, let me know in the comments section what you think of this video or what you'd like to see me cover on the next video or upcoming video. Don't forget I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com, and you guys can catch me on my other social media platforms covering different types of questions almost daily, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So guys, let's get started, and we're starting with acute epiglottitis. By the way, this is a medical emergency. The minute you hear epiglottitis, you better think medical emergency. Let's take a look. A presumptive diagnosis of acute epiglottitis or acute supraglottitis is a what? Medical emergency. Guys, anything that restricts or obstructs the airway, that's a big deal because we don't care about anything else if that patient's not breathing, right? Right. So let's look at the clinical manifestations. At the beginning, the onset of epiglottitis is abrupt. That means it happens in an instant. It's not something that's slow. It's not something that's insidious. It is abrupt. And it can rapidly, very quickly progress to severe respiratory distress. The child usually goes to bed asymptomatic. So when they go to bed, they really don't have many symptoms. To awaken later, complaining of a sore throat and pain on swallowing. The child has a fever, they appear sicker than clinical findings suggest, and they insist on sitting upright and leaning forward with the chin thrust out, mouth open, and tongue protruding. That's known as the tripod position. Let me tell you something. You ever see a child or an adult, for that matter, take on this position? That's the patient you're running to. That tripod position, them sitting forward, that tongue sticking out, why? That airway's obstructed. They're trying to breathe. They're trying to get oxygen to their lungs, okay? Drooling of saliva is common because of the difficulty or the pain on swallowing and excessive secretions. So now on top of their airway possibly being occluded, all of that saliva, what else are we concerned about? Aspiration. Let's keep going. The child is irritable. Well, I would be too. They're extremely restless. And remember, guys, restlessness, isn't that a clinical manifestation, a sign and symptom when the patient's not getting enough oxygen to their brain? Yes, it is. Restless and has, um, and has an anxious, apprehensive, and frightened expression. Why? Because they can't breathe. The voice is thick and muffled with frog-like croaking. That frog-like croaking, that is a, a, a classic symptom of epiglottitis, okay? Frog-like croaking sound on inspiration, but the child is not hoarse. The throat is red, it's inflamed, and the distinctive large cherry red edamidus epiglot epiglottis is visible on careful inspection. Let's take a look at these nursing alerts. When you guys are studying I tell you this a million times, I promise. And the reason I keep telling you guys this is because this is where your test questions are coming from. Those nursing alerts, those diagrams, those tables, those illustrations, those charts, those are where your test questions are coming from. Why? Because the author took the time not only to put stuff in the text, but the same thing they're putting in the text, they're giving it to you in a different way to make sure that you get it. Why? Because it's important. So let's look at this first nursing alert. Three clinical observations that are predictive. That means when you see this, that lets you know this is going to happen. Predictive of epiglottitis are absence of spontaneous cough. They can't do that anymore. Presence of drooling and agitation. That triad, guys, that... Um, is presumptive. That should make you know that, oh my gosh, this patient's airway is about to close up very, very uh, soon. Okay. Next nursing alert. 
throat inspection should be attempted. What does it say? Only, only by experienced personnel when equipment is available, because guess what? You may need an airway. Equipment is available to proceed with immediate intubation or tracheostomy. So let me ask you something. If you suspect that a patient has epiglottitis or possibly is about to have it, their airway is about to be obstructed, are you going to stick a tongue blade in their mouth to assess? Uh -uh. Look what it says. Throat inspection should be attempted only by experienced personnel. Let's keep going. Therapeutic management. The child who suspected of having epiglottitis should be examined in a setting where emergency airway equipment is readily available. Because let me tell you something, after that assessment, that might be enough irritation to that area to cause their throat to close up and that patient will have to be trait, okay? Examination of the throat with the tongue depressors, what? Contraindicated. It is contraindicated until experienced personnel and equipment are available to proceed with immediate intubation or tracheostomy in the event that the, that, that the examination precipitates further or complete obstruction. That exam might be enough to cause complete obstruction and you have to be ready for that. We expect this patient to be on humidified oxygen, um, antibiotic therapy, if, um, um, bacteria is the cause, which it usually is, corticosteroids for the swelling and inflammation. Care management. It's important to act quickly, but calmly and to provide support without increasing anxiety. The child's allowed to remain in the position that provides the most comfort and security, and the parents are reassured that everything possible is being done to obtain relief for the child. Other nursing alert, when epiglottitis is suspected, not confirmed, what does it say? Suspected. The nurse should not attempt to visualize the epiglottitis directly with a tongue depressor or a or take a throat culture, but they should refer the child for medical evaluation immediately. How many times have we seen this? At least three times within the past three paragraphs. Why? Why did they put it in um, text? Then they put it in a nursing alert. Now we're seeing in another nursing alert because it's gonna be a test question for you and you better know it. Don't say I didn't warn you. Okay, guys, so anyway, that is your epiglottitis in a nutshell. Now, the second part I'm gonna do is acute laryng laryngotracheal bronchitis, okay? That is also going to be part of the upper respiratory um, infections part two. Acute laryngotracheal bronchitis. So this disease is usually preceded by an upper respiratory infection, such as influenza or the common cold, right? So a patient had an upper respiratory infection, and I said influenza, but that's actually a lower respiratory infection. So let's go, let's go with the cold. That's upper respiratory infection. So it's usually preceded by upper respiratory infection, which gradually descends to adjacent structures. It's characterized. Remember, guys, whenever you see that word characterized, pay attention, because that lets you know when you see this, 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 you better be thinking that, that, and that. It's characterized by gradual slow, insidious onset of low-grade fever, and the parents often report that the child went to bed and later awoke with, this is your key, barky, brassy cough. Inflammation of the mucosa uh, lining, the larynx and trachea causes a narrowing of the airway. Uh-oh. So this is also an issue where the patient may have decreased oxygen, right? Other classic symptoms include cough and hoarseness. Respiratory distress in infants and toddlers can be manifested by nasal flaring. Why do you think nasal flaring, I don't know how close this camera is, but I hope you can see my nose well. I hope I'm having any boogers in my nose. Hope not, hopefully not. But anyway, when you see the nose go like this, I'm trying to do it. You see the difference? Their, their nares flare out because it's just a natural reaction of them trying to get oxygen, right? Nasal flaring intercostal retractions, tachypnea, and continuous strider. When you see that word strider, that is a medical emergency. Guys, strider is the sound of oxygen trying to get through an occluded airway. That's what strider is. It's never good. The typical child 
with laryngotracheal bronchitis develops the classic barking or seal-like cough. You ever heard of seal? Seal-like cough and acute strider after several days of rhinitis. So they got lots of several days of runny nose. When the child's unable to inhale a sufficient volume of air, symptoms of hypoxia become evident. Obstruction that is severe enough to prevent adequate ventilation and exhalation of carbon dioxide can cause respiratory acidosis. Why? They're holding on to all that CO2 instead of getting rid of it. They're not getting enough um, O2 and they're holding on to the CO2. That will throw them into respiratory acidosis or, like I said, carbon dioxide carbon diacid. So you guys can remember carbon dioxide is acidic. So that's going to throw them into respiratory acidosis and eventually respiratory failure. Therapeutic management. Children with mild croup, no strider at rest can be managed at home. But if they're strider, they have to be at acute care facility. They need to be in the hospital. Okay. Parents are taught the signs and symptoms of respiratory distress. Remember, guys, we want the O2 sat to be between 98 and 100. Preferably, that is the best case situation. But we will accept 95 to 100. We'll accept 95 to 100. Lower than 95, once you hit um, 90 or lower, that patient's in respiratory distress. That's a problem, okay? Children with labored respirations and strider or, or other respiratory symptoms should receive medical attention. You're going to give them humidity with cool mist, cool air, air vaporizer, nebulized mist, supplemental oxygen, all of this as ordered. Nebulized epinephrine is often used in children with severe disease, strider at rest, retractions, or difficulty breathing. You see this retractions, guys, if they're using their accessory muscles to breathe, they're, they're not breathing adequately, okay? Oral steroids, such as dexamethasone, remember, guys, steroids decrease inflammation. Nebulize um, budesonide. On occasion, intubation and ventilation may be required when the airway obstruction becomes more severe. Care management. Look at this nursing alert. If cool mist is used in the treatment, it can be administered through a tube held in front of the patient. Look at this, this is your key. That's why I highlighted it. While the child is held on the parent's lap. I want you to think about it. They already can't breathe, right? Do we really want them upset and crying because they have to be away from their safety net, which is the parent? No, let them sit on the parent's lap to get the nebulizer treatment, all right? Or the cool mist. Children need the security of the parent's presence because crying increases respiratory distress and hypoxia. It's gonna make it worse. The family should be allowed to remain with the child as much as possible. Parents need frequent reassurance provided in, again, guys, a calm, quiet manner because they're gonna feed off of your energy. So if you're freaking out, the patient's gonna be freaking out and so are the parents. So you have to deliver care in a calm, quiet manner and education regarding what they can do to make their child more comfortable. Nothing relieves anxiety like education does. Many times the parents will be very anxious and they'll give you a hard time just because they're scared. But when you educate them and you let them know what you're doing and you let them know what to expect, that relieves their anxiety. And when the patient sees the parents aren't freaking out, they relax. So education is a very big deal and you need to keep the parents informed every step of the way. All right. So guys, that is your pediatric upper respiratory infections part two in a nutshell. Let me know what you guys thought about this video. Let me know what you'd like to see more of. Let me know what you thought about this video. And um, don't forget, I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video and you guys will catch me on the next video.